stay with him. Hebrews, the second chapter, we'll start reading with verse 10. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory. Many who? I'm going to erase the sanctuary for now. We have that in mind. Okay. Many sons. This is the context of this chapter to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings for both he that sanctifies who's he okay that's Jesus okay both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified the many sons are all of one that is the father they all come from the same place. Jesus and the many sons. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Now that's not the way we're used to hearing that scripture. We're used to hearing it for which cause he's not ashamed to call them brethren. And that puts the emphasis entirely in the wrong place. The scripture is telling us in three verses that he is not ashamed to call them brethren. He's not calling anybody else brethren. That's the point of these three scriptures. Hebrews always say it twice so we don't miss it. <laughs> Next verse. Saying... I will declare thy name unto my brethren, the many sons, and just so we don't miss it, in the midst of the church. Okay? Will I sing praise unto thee? In verse 13, And again I will put my trust in him, and again behold I and the children which God has given me the many sons. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had power of death, and that is the devil. I hope that you see the importance of this context that he has developed here. This is a masterful job of excluding somebody in this presentation. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Adam. Oh, it doesn't say Adam, does it? Why is it that everybody who tries to talk about the nature of Christ puts Adam in this chapter? Think about it for just a moment. Adam isn't in this chapter. Either before the fall or after the fall, he is not in this chapter. The many sons are. And the name here is Abraham. Who was Abraham? The father of the faithful, the many sons. The context is inviolable in Hebrews 2. There's nothing here about Adam at all. Wherefore, in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. 
For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he's able to succor them that are tempted. That's the end of the chapter, folks, and Adam is not mentioned at all. And this is the place where everybody goes to prove their point. It's not there. Now, the only thing that was discussed in this chapter after this masterful building of the context is the flesh and the blood of Jesus. There's nothing in this chapter about his mind or his spiritual life. Nothing. If we want to know about that, we need to go someplace else, and there's lots of information, but not in this chapter. Either one. He couldn't be like Adam before or after. That's the point of this chapter. Adam's not mentioned here. That's the only point I'm trying to establish right now. And you can go anyplace else in the Bible you want to. That subject is never discussed in the Word of God. The sanctuary teaches it. Ellen White teaches it. And we're going to see what the Bible says about who Jesus really was. Yes. All right, but this is very important that we know this is what Paul was talking about Hebrews 2. Don't ever go to Hebrews 2 to prove that Jesus was either way concerning Adam. It's not there. All right. Uh, we hit flesh. There's the flesh. There's the outside. And we just hit blood, the red ram. That's the blood. Have you ever seen a red ram? <laughs> he was dyed red, wasn't he? Where'd they get the dye? That's a, an interesting question. There's so many little alleys you have to go down through to find things in the scriptures. A lot of things are not explained. Well, the Bible doesn't tell us for sure where the dye came from, but it does give us some very strong clues. There's a thing called Onica that was used in the incense. And Onica, there were no flowers out there to dye red. No, there were no flowers, no normal organic things we would think of that makes red dye out there in the desert. They had to pull something in from someplace else, and it was Onica shells. They were red, and you could grind them up and use them as dye. That works. Onica. They didn't bring those uh, with them out of Egypt? They brought lots of stuff out, but it was Onica shells they used for this, yeah. Yes. Onica, it's, excuse me? It's just a little shell, a little seashell. <laughs> okay, I was wondering why nobody asked that one. <laughs> all right. Uh, there's lots of water all around them there, so they could have gotten it from there. But, as the brother just suggested here, they did bring a lot of supplies out with them from Egypt. So there's no problem with them having these things. Egypt was the metropolis of the world. Excuse me? There's a flood. This is after the flood. There's more seashells on top of the land than there is in the ocean. Oh, yeah, the desert would have all kinds of seashells, but the seals. Seal skins. Seal skins, yeah. So, no, there's no problem getting seal skins over there. As a matter of fact, the, the uh, word. In the Hebrew, it doesn't say seals. It says amphibious animal. So there was no problem for them to deal with amphibious animals. Okay, thank you. All right, so now we've got two elements here. We've got the, blood, the flesh and the blood. That's all we have discovered so far in Romans 8 and in Hebrews 2. Just flesh and blood. Nothing else. Now... Before we go any further, I would like to just point out here that uh, Jesus had a physical nature. He had a spiritual nature. He was divine in his own right. And he had the power of his father in him. We're not going to understand who Jesus is unless we see all four of those all together. In his humanity, he had those two sides to him. 
He did not use his divine powers for himself. He had them. He always lived as a man in the power of his father. And that's the issue in humanity. Can we do the same thing? Will we live under the power of Christ? All right, so for now, we see these four coverings, and we're trying to see who Jesus really is, incorporating those four elements of his entire being. The goat hair was white, and it was under the flesh and the blood. The flesh and the blood is two aspects of his physical nature. Okay? Flesh and blood. That's physical. His spiritual nature was goat hair, white. What does white mean? So his spiritual nature was pure and holy, undefiled, unblemished. So Jesus was sinless. So Jesus was sinless in a sinful, physical, fallen nature. His spiritual nature was not fallen. And of course, the uh, four colors here represent the totality of his humanity, and we'll just plug that in there. We see four coverings on the sanctuary which teach us who Jesus really is. He is a human with all the aspects of humanity, but it's divided up into four sections so we can look at it. The flesh and the blood were unclean. Seashells are unclean. That's how you get the red ram skin. And his interior nature, his spiritual nature, is pure and righteous. The four colors, blue, obedience to the law, Red, total 100% commitment. Purple, royal priest. White, righteousness again. All of them combined. So we see his humanity uh, all revealed. And this was on the inside because that's what the priest could see. Covered by the totality of Jesus in his humanity. Now, this is not only in the Bible and the sanctuary, we are now going to start reading some statements from Ellen White. Three witnesses, you can't back down three witnesses. Yes, that's right. Yeah, we're plugging in lots of things here, but the most important thing we're looking at tonight is what is the genuine born again experience. We will never know it if we miss this. That's right. All right, I'm going to start reading just a few statements. Well, let's see, where should we go first? Let's go to Hebrews, since uh, that's what we... I'm going to read from 7a. Since that's what we uh, started with here was Hebrews. And I'm only going to use this book tonight for this subject. Just going to be pulling statements out of here so we know that a lot is just in one little place. It's all over her writings, but... Uh, We'll see it just here. On page 924, I think we'll read that first. It says in the left column, about point seven, the enemy was overcome by Christ in his human nature. The power of the Savior's Godhead was hidden. He overcame in human nature relying upon God for power. In the right column, about the same place, he lived out the character of God through the human body which God had prepared for him. So, uh, did he set aside his God powers? Did he leave them in heaven? No. There are people out there 
conservative Seventh-day Adventists who are very famous in this world now who teach that Jesus emptied himself of his God powers. And they are misusing Philippians, the second chapter. When it says he emptied himself, it means he did not use self in his life as a human. He followed the plans of his father. We read that three times today. Self was not an issue with him. He emptied himself of self. But he did not cease to be God. That man was God. Page 925, right column, about point eight, uh, point seven again. I'm just reading little pieces here. Please go look these up. He was born without a, a taint of sin, but came in the hu world in a manner as the human family, like manner as the human family. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to rush along here. 926. Christ lived and died as a man that he might be God both of the living and the dead. It was to make it impossible for men to lose eternal life if they believe on him. I want you to hang on to that thought as we move through this. On page 927, at the top of the page there on the right column, not even by a thought could Christ be brought to yield to the power of temptation. Page 929. Right column, top of the page again. Jesus, 7, yeah, volume 7. Jesus was free from all sin and error. There was not a trace of imperfection in his life or character. He maintained spotless purity under circumstances the most trying. <coughs> that doesn't sound to me like he had a pull to sin. You're going to hear that one. He had a pull to sin, but he resisted it. Because he was just like us, that's what they say. Now, if I say then to the world when I do evangelism that Jesus is the only one of his kind, unique, can I then tag this sentence on, oh, he was just like us. <laughs> you see how that doesn't work? And yet we have theologians wandering around all over the place in the conservative camp who write books and have meetings and send out tapes and lots of other things, and they're all saying he was just like us. He was like Adam after the fall. And then they go to Hebrews 2 to prove it. This is very, very strange. This all came out of the mind of Brinsmead. I'm going to name that name. Robert friends me. All right, let's read some more statements very quickly here. We're running out of time. I'm going to go to, uh, uh, let's see here, John. Let's just pick up some statements in John. I'm just thumbing through here now. Gospel of John, I'm going to pick up some statements uh, in 7a here, volume 5 in this book. On page 1128, Christ had not exchanged his divinity for humanity, but he had clothed his divinity in humanity. Plain statement. Uh, page uh, 1129, he did not cease to be God when he became man. And of course, if they say he left his divinity in heaven, then he would have none to use on this earth. So I'm going to read three statements on the same page, right column. First paragraph. There were occasions when Jesus stood forth while in human flesh as a son of God. Divinity flashed through humanity. And of course, the first thing the people who don't want to believe this say, oh, that was the Father's divinity. So let's read the next part of the statement. 
When Christ's indwelling glory flashed forth, when what? When Christ's indwelling glory flashed forth, it was too intense for his pure and perfect humanity. I've never heard this one quoted. His pure and perfect humanity entirely to conceal. This is in the middle of seven, volume 5, page 1129, Bible commentary. Well, that one still could be taken this way or that way, so we'll read the next one. <laughs> Same setting. The scribes and Pharisees did not speak in acknowledgment of him, but their enmity and hatred were baffled as his majesty shone forth. No way to get past that one. His majesty. Jesus was God. And you know, it's an interesting thing to me that we may have a problem understanding it today, but they sure had no problem back in his day. In John the 8th chapter, when he said, before Abraham was, I am, they picked up the rocks immediately. They didn't have the slightest question what he said. Page 1131, I'm compressing. In taking upon himself man's nature in its fallen condition, Christ did not in the least participate in its sin. He was subject to the infirmities and weaknesses by which man is encompassed. What are those weaknesses? Have to eat. Weariness. Weariness. 4,000 years. 4, years of heredity. That's flesh and blood. You can't make a person sin in their mind through heredity. Page 1131, right column, top of the page. He knew no sin. He was a lamb without blemish, without spot. Could Satan in the least particular have tempted Christ to sin, he would have bruised the Savior's head. As it was, he could only touch his heel. We spent some time with it earlier, one of the speakers here. Had the head of Christ been touched, the hope of the human race would have perished. What's in the head? Yeah, the mind. The mind. That's where all the issues are. We should have no misgivings in regard to the perfect sinlessness of the human nature of Christ. Now, I'm just reading. All right, I'm not going to continue that vein. I need to hit one more point before we have to stop tonight. There's a word that seems to trip everybody up who wants to study, study this subject. And that one word is in the last verse of Hebrews 2. We've all been programmed for this one. <laughs> yes. And here's, it took me three years of thinking this through and asking God to reveal it to me. What's the hang-up? Why can't highly intelligent people, sincere, honest people, not cross the line to see what the Bible's really saying here? And it was this word. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, there's the word, he is able to comfort them that are tempted. Now, what does this word tempted mean? God uses it one way, and the human race has been taught to use it another way. Uh-huh. I'm going to just say it the way humans say it. Oh, I was really tempted to do that. And of course, we all know what, what was being said there. Oh, I wanted to do it. <laughs> Oh, boy, do I have... Yeah. That's not the way God uses the word, ever. We were all taught by our parents, our friends, relatives, pastors, somebody, to think that the word tempted means you want to. God never uses the word that way. And if we put that use of the word on Jesus, we're going to make him a sinner. That's right. And that's precisely what the camp is doing that, he believe, that believes he was just like them. Here's the word they use to apologize for that blasphemy. 
They say, he had a pull to sin, but somehow he didn't. The word is somehow. Listen for it. There's no somehow to this. He was sinless. He had no desire to ever sin against his father. Excellent. Excellent. That's in this volume 7 too. Under, uh, Do not make him altogether human, one just like us, for it can never be. That's what the statement is. Well, I have to turn back to it. It's over here in volume 7, 924, somewhere in there. Tested? tested? Did you say tested? <laughs> Let's look for the word. I'm going to start reading real quick here. Page 1179, volume 5, Bible Commentary. Christ was our example in all things as we see his humiliation in, in the long trial and fast in the wilderness to overcome the temptations of appetite. Oh, there's a word, temptations of appetite. Uh, in our behalf, we are to take this lesson home to ourselves when we are tempted. If the power of appetite is so strong upon the human family and its indulgence so fearful that the Son of God subjected himself to such a test, there's the word. There it is in that context. Temptation, tempted, test. Can you find the word desire in there any place? Next page. Well, I'm going to skip that page and move on to something we can see very quickly. Uh, page 1081, right column. When Adam was assailed by the tempter, now was that inside or outside? All right, the tempter. Could we say the tester? Okay, the tempter, in Eden, he was without the taint of sin. He stood in the strength of his perfection before God. All the organs and faculties of his being were equally developed and harmoniously balanced. Christ in the wilderness of temptation stood in Adam's place to bear the test. Have we run into the word desire yet? Page 1082. In Christ, divinity and humanity were combined. Left column. Divinity was not degraded to humanity. Divinity held its place, but humanity, by being united to divinity, withstood the fiercest test of temptation. The prince of this world came to Christ after his long fast when he was hungered and suggested, new word, suggested to him. Uh, let's see, lost my place. That he command the stones to be turned into bread. That's the rest of the sentence. <laughs> okay. Now, we have run into another word here. A temptation and a suggestion. A tempter and somebody who has suggested. Where's the word desire? We're never going to find it. Never. It's not in the word of God. It's not in the spirit of prophecy. The word temptation as used by God means test or trial. Now, let's go back to Hebrews 2 very quickly here and let's see what that verse is saying now. For in that he himself has suffered being tested, he is able to comfort them which are tested. Now, do you know his reaction to the test from that verse? No, there's nothing in that verse that says what his response was. And there's nothing in that verse that says the response of whoever else is being tested. All it says is everybody's being tested. Ah, oh, yes, he suffered. When he saw little children tying cattails together, two living cats, he suffered. 
When he saw injustice of any kind, he suffered. When he saw what humans were doing to themselves, he suffered. He did a lot of suffering, but it was not based on an inner pull to want to sin. That was not in him. He never for a moment wanted to sin against his father. It never happened. Now there's one ultimate place, and before I go there, I need to take you to the direct definition of temptation, as Ellen White says it. Volume 1, Bible Commentary, page 1094. What is temptation? <laughs> okay, here it comes. <laughs> It is the means by which those who claim to be the children of God are tested and tried. There's the definition of the word temptation. Test, trial. Well, what good is a temptation if you don't want to do it? I know what somebody's thinking in here. <laughs> yeah, that's the little program that's been put in us, see? I'm going to have to test you now. <laughs> These days are cooling down. And let's say I go back to the cabin. Somebody has set up one of these video cameras over there in the corner. And there's a hot cup of chocolate sitting in there. And I go in, I'm chilled, I'm cold. Nobody's around, just me and that sneaky little camera in the corner. And I go in, and I look at that chocolate. Later on that day, <laughs> I come to you and say, you know what? I went into my cabin, and I was tempted with a hot cup of chocolate. Now, I'm using the word the way God uses it in his Holy Bible. What did I just say to you? I was tested with a cup of chocolate. Does anybody here know my reaction? No. No. It's impossible for you to know with that sentence that I was tempted with a cup of chocolate. All I've told you is there was a test there. There was a trial. You know nothing about my response. Well, I can tell you my response. I used to drink hot cups of chocolate on cold days. I enjoyed them. But one day when I became a Christian, the Lord told me, for you, I want you to do something for me and yourself. I want you to keep your central nervous system in condition so I can talk to you. I don't want you engaging in theobromine and sugar and a few other things. I want you to leave that alone. And I said, yes, Lord. Thank you. Yes, Lord. And so on the day when I came in here and I saw the hot chocolate, something inside of me did remember, yes. <laughs> and I said, oh, that would be nice. But then, James 4, 7 has to be there. Submit to God. Resist. The devil's gone. He's not a factor. And I can just walk away from that and say, no problem, Lord, thank you. With you, I can do all things. Now, I'm going to give you another one real quick like. You did very well on that. <laughs> Hot day. Same room, same camera. I go inside the room. There's a cold can of beer. <laughs> I walk inside the room. Later on in the day, I come to you and say, you know what? I walked into that room and I was tempted with a can of cold beer. What have I said to you? I was tested. Okay, same thing. No, pro no difference between the, that circumstance and this one. None at all. Same word. Tested. You still don't know my reaction, do you? In Hebrews 2, when it says Jesus was tested in all points, you don't know his reaction either in that verse. And you don't know the reaction of all those that he comforts. 
They're tested too. There's nothing in that chapter that goes to Adam or tells you the reaction spiritually. Nothing. The only thing that chapter is discussing is flesh and blood. And that is physical nature. Jesus was made like Christians. And the reason Paul said it that way was so that no one later on in history could say he was just like the human race. No, he's like Christians. That's very different. And that allows us to begin to look into the born-again experience and see what it really means. If Jesus is like people who haven't been born again, who want to sin, but they're resisting it somehow, they drag Jesus down to their level and say, he's like me, so it must be okay to want to sin. That's the real message. No, let's not drag him down. He's God. He became a man and he showed us what a man can be depending on that power of God. And so let's be lifted up there and let's become like him. This is a very deep study. We just touched the tops of it tonight. I better give you my reaction to the beer. <laughs> right. <laughs> When I was a child, somebody got a teaspoon of the stuff and shoved it in my face. And I didn't stop gagging for several minutes. No one's ever going to do that to me again. No problem with that beer. <laughs> All right, let's bottom it out here. Jesus was tempted in all points, such as man must be tempted, tested, tried. How many tests did he have? Three. Three. That's it. That's all we need to pass. Not thousands, not millions. Three. That's all. If we just settle that, we're headed towards the seal of God, the final seal. The first one takes care of the other two. If we will conquer on the point of appetite, we will be overcomers over every other temptation. That's a promise. Yeah. So really it boils down to one really solid decision that holds for eternity. Do you see why the devil makes such a big joke out of a little thing like cheese? It's not a little thing. That will keep us away from the other two. Appetite, trust, worship. When we get them down, all three of them, we're ready. We can be seen. And God will test us through all the processes to be sure we know that it really is an overcoming experience. That's right. She says it is impossible. Excuse me? Well, say, say it again so I can get it the way you said it. That if we, if we cannot overcome appetite, we will fail in perfecting Christian character. All right. If we fail overcoming appetite, we will fail perfecting Christian character. That's right. Basically, there's only three things we need to live with God. We don't have time to investigate those right now. Study the three temptations of Christ. See if they jump out at you what the issues are there. I'll just give you the first one in, in one sentence. I would rather die of starvation than eat something that God does not give me to eat. That's the issue there. Thank you. No, it means every kind of desire we can have. Yeah, if we submit everything to God, every desire, and when we finally can say, I don't want anything that my Father doesn't give me, we have understood the issue. Uh huh. That's the eye and the world. Yes, pride of life. That's it, right there, those three things. 
There's different ways to say it. That's the way Ellen White says it, surely. The lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and pride of the world. Yes. We're, we're touching it now, folks. We've reached the place where this becomes reality. Tomorrow we're going to talk about the difference between intentional and unaware, ignorant sin. <laughs> You've had your rest. <laughs> yes, brother. Yes, he turned his will over to his father. That's right. Yeah. All right, let me paraphrase that just a little bit here. I'm fishing for the page in here now. It says that it was as difficult for the Son of Man to live in his humanity under the power of the Father without using his divinity as it is for man not to use his depraved nature and to live in the power of Christ. It's exactly the same test. His. He had an inclination whenever he was in extreme peril to use his God powers. I don't think we're ever going to touch that one. <laughs> She says, he who knew absolute authority in heaven. I mean, get a hold of that. He who knew absolute... Here's another one as we close tonight. God uses all his omnipotent powers to restrain himself. Well, there's a big difference. Sure, there's no, no pull to sin. He had no inclination to sin on any direction, no propensity to sin, no desire to sin. I can show you statements that use those kinds of words. But he did have a very intelligent grasp of the situation. This doesn't feel good. This is the direction to take. But no, it's not important. Father, your will be done. And maybe I should say that at last, because I don't know if we'll get back to any of this. The one final argument that is used by the people who insist on making him like Adam after the fall is they say Jesus had a conflict with his father. He said, Father, take this cup away from me, please. They said, see, there was a conflict between the father and the son. There's no conflict there. There's no conflict there. Let me see if I can find it quickly. I'm trying to close here tonight. <laughs> All right, his humanity was speaking, and there's nothing wrong with that. That was very intelligent, the way he was approaching that. Anybody who understood the issues would have said the same thing, and certainly he knew the issues. All right, I'm going to read this on page 1076. Yes, 1076, volume 6, Bible Commentary. When he gives us a bitter draft to drink, he also holds up a cup of blessing to our lips. He fills the heart with submission with joy and peace in believing and enables us to say submissively, not my will, but thy will, O Lord, be done. Now, if Jesus does that with us, that we can say with joy and peace in believing, in total submission, not my will, but your will, do you suppose Jesus said it that way that night? right he was in total submission there was no conflict of will don't let anybody cross that thought in your mind because that's their ultimate argument and it's no good Jesus loved to submit to his father I have to just play one more it's impossible to leave these grand themes without <laughs> Jesus has always been in submission to the Father. From all eternity he has been the Son. That's right. 
Read it in Patriarchs and Prophets. Read it any place you want to see the discussion. He has always loved to be in submission to the Father. God with us, yes. Yes. Now these are beautiful themes. You know, in one week together here we can share with one another, but we're not going to touch any of the wonderful things that we can know. In the sanctuary, we will never get to the point where we will not be in submission. Yes, submission is the whole issue. And if Jesus loves to be in submission to his Father and always has throughout all eternity, then what's wrong with that? <laughs> Why shouldn't we be in submission to the Father? It's the joy of Christ. In that sense, his righteousness stays with us. Yes, it's always emanating from him, but we must become righteous. That's right. All right, let's close for tonight.